And building that's what this is all yeah. about, how these people <laughs> are still doing this. And I know since we've got a lot of locals here who are still trying to do it every day, um, and we're all asking ourselves, how can we stay younger? How can we stay fitter? How can we manage ourselves a little bit better? We all know that there have been people through the course of time that have done it at an at a old age, if you will. Those of you who are NFL fans, George Blanda played when he was about 49 years old. Um, Satchel Paige pitched at 59. Um, you know, Martina Navratilova did it to a very late, late age. The Williams sisters are doing it right now, but if you look at the horizon today, you know, Tom Brady, I think, is 42. Drew Brees is 40. Um, it, it's just incredible. Roger Federer is still doing it at, at the you know, pinnacle of his game. So it's pretty amazing. And so what we're trying to get from these folks who are still doing it and doing it so well is how? And, and how are you managing to do this? What is the difference today? Is it simply we know more about how to take care of ourselves? Anybody? What are you looking at I me mean, for? <laughs> <laughs> I've been climbing uh, professionally, been climbing mountains and trying to ski them for 20 years. So I started when I was 26. I've been on 40 expeditions, I think. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the title is the four, our 40s and new 20s, and I would say no, I don't think they are. I think that I wouldn't want to be 20 again, <laughs> maybe my 30s. But um, it, what I know now, it's like, um, are you guys familiar with like the 10,000 hour rule, yeah. where you just become such an expert in your field? And obviously what I'm doing is very different than what you guys do. But uh, you take that 10,000 hour rule and, I went from being the youngest on any given expedition to being the oldest, and I just have a respect for my body. I've been fortunate not to have a lot of in injuries. I guard my rest. We talked about this. I guard my rest really well. And I think that for me, I, I can just see what is happening around me so well that I'm very efficient with my movements and my physicality. Is it enough to say, let's just be wiser and not do it harder today? Is that, is that what you I gain with age? I think, okay, I think there was a time, like for me as a basketball player, when I was supposed to lock myself in the gym and just shoot for hours and hours and hours and hours. I think that was important, that I had a chunk of years where it's just like, I just love this game so much, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my imagination, and I'm just going to shoot against... Michael Jordan, and I'm going to hit game winners, and I'm going to shoot, and I'm going to shoot, and I'm going to shoot, and I'm going to, what does this basketball mean to me? You know, like there's a, there's a period of time where that's important. Yeah. But then once you've developed that love and appreciation and, and you want to keep on going, like you have to get smarter at some yeah. point. Like you have to. We all break. We're human beings. We will all break. And like technology, since when I came into the NBA uh, 16 years ago, like the, what we have to use now is just, it's so far beyond what I came in with. When I came in, we had like, you should do some yoga and ice your knees, right? Like <laughs> yoga was the secret, like do yoga and you're gonna feel good. I did yoga for a whole summer one year, like a whole summer, I could touch my toes like so good. <laughs> and the first week of training camp, I pulled my groin. Yeah. <laughs> right, and I'm like, no, I, no, I don't like, so like what, but, like I did this, uh, Marcus Elias here, at P3. Um, we did a, a panel yesterday on just big data and how we're really able to, to understand our bodies and understand that we're all so different. Yeah. Like you are, Kevin's game and his body is so different than mine. So when we're on the same team and we go into the weight room, like he's got to focus on different things than me. When I first came into the NBA, that wasn't an option. It was just like there was this dry erase board and it's like, you know, four sets of this, three sets of that, and we all did the exact same thing. It's not like that anymore. It's so much smarter, and we're just gonna get smarter and smarter. Right now, it's all aimed more towards us, like a lot of the big technology. It's gonna, it's gonna shuffle down to everybody. It's all coming that way. It's a really exciting time, I yeah. think. Is the team format, the team environment, receptive to the idea that you now have to be individuals within a team, that you have to take care of your body, Kevin Love, mm -hmm. different, then Kyle has to take care of his body. Yeah, I think Kyle made a great point. Like, all the science and, and uh, you know, it's all trending in the right direction. But there isn't a one-size-fits-all 
fits all model for each person. I think well, the MBA has done such a good job, I'm speaking about uh, what I know in the MBA is that you know, they've actually taken uh, you know, certain players and they've now hired many more people than in the past to then distribute their time among guards, among power forwards, among shooting guards, centers, so that they can get the best out of them and their performance on the, on the floor. Because as Kyle mentioned to and alluded to, we're not gonna train the same way. I have to play powerful. I have to be able to play in the paint. I have to be able to you know, really hold guys off. Whereas Kyle, it's gonna be uh, you know, lateral movement. He's gonna be you know, getting off screens, making sure that he has enough space to get his shot off. And it, like I said, there's just no one size fits all model. So it's just adjusting to what you need. And I think to uh, the previous questions, it's just really going through it. And maybe uh, you know, it's, it's, it was quantity over quality in a lot of times. And then you figure out, okay, I've, I've either you know, I had injuries or nag nagging injuries that I'm dealing with, like Con Kyle mentioned with his groin, or you know, for me, I've had uh, a lot of contact injuries that I've had to you know rehabilitate from, and then kind of find out find out where the discrepancies were, come back, and uh, you know, really have quality quality workouts where it's not only the work I'm doing on the basketball court or in the weight room, but it's meditation, it's massage, it's sleep, it's I mean, so on and so forth, anything that you can think of, but it's really listening to your body and figuring out what you need in that day. So using, yes, the people and the trainers to, at your disposal, but also waking up and saying, okay, I gotta be a little bit selfish. I have to know, and I have to put forth exactly what I need in that moment every single day so that I can help my team and have the best product for them out there on the floor. I, I wanna come back to Hilly for a second because I read one article about you when you were talking about a climb that you were gonna do at Makalu and how you wanted to climb without oxygen and you compared it to a previous climb at Choyu, but you said it's a much harder climb than Choyu. I'm 10 years older. What did that mean to you in terms of how it was going to test you at 10 years later? Well, I didn't know. I think that was the biggest thing. I'd been on 8,000 meter peaks in the interim but not had success, not been to the summit. And uh, I had used oxygen on a, a couple other 8,000 meter peaks in between as well. And uh, a lot of what I do is high altitude. So I had had pneumonia several times um, and various lung infections. And so in 10 years, I hadn't been super nice on my body. I'd been pretty hard on myself. And so I think I was just more afraid that because of those 10 years and the wear and tear just on my lungs, I might not be able to do it. So, but I like being in that space and, and pushing into that and figuring out how I can train or, or how I can rest my body and, and um, try it and just see if it works. In, in layman's terms, does Wiser, when you're, when you're practicing or actually on an expedition, does Wiser mean pacing? You know, so we might say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to run a six miles, you know, event, but I'm going to do it a little bit slower than, I, than I've done in the past. Probably efficiency would yeah. be the word, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's what you, it's, it's not something that um, is just a, a, it's something that's learned is what I'm trying to say. That, that takes time. That, that comes with, with age, I think. Um, does that mean you don't go after the rebound every single time because you I know? I didn't say that. No, 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 but that's, but that, but that's what I'm asking. Like, do you, think, do you have to make think, that judgment that I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna get that ball, so there's no point in expending the energy at this point to get that, because that's a waste. But maybe the efficiency is that you can read who's going for the ball better and be yes. positioned decision better. Decision so making, and I think that also comes with uh, time put in. I mean, we've yeah. all you know, mastered our crafts in, in our career, and while they are different, um, I think you learn where to, where to really pick your spots while also you know, chasing and have the grit to, to go after you know, every rebound, assume everything's a miss. So I think it's, it's one thing is a mindset, but it's also uh, having the presence of mind to um, not pace yourself, but uh, you know, uh, allow yourself to, to really pick your spots in the best way to get the best out of yourself for, for whether it's a team sport or whether it's you know, an individual sport. Kyle, can you tell me some things, since you've been at this in the NBA for 16 years, give me something specific that you've done differently now in terms of keeping your body healthy, whether it's 
managing your sleep, monitoring your sleep, the, the different types of technology that you've put to use than you did when you first came into the yeah. league? I think when you first come in, you just have all this energy and you're just like so excited and you're really ready to do everything, right? I think over time you create this lifestyle. I call it like my basketball lifestyle. I have these boundaries within my life that I gotta live within. Like we all need boundaries in life. When we're raising kids, we teach, we have, we have to tell them they need boundaries. Like I need boundaries in my basketball life, right? Um, you know, sleep is one of my boundaries and what I eat is one of my boundaries. I don't, like it's gotta be fun. Like I can't be so regimented that I'm a robot, right? But like I gotta find this like life that feels good and that I'm working hard within. Like, for my workouts on practice days, I may not be able to practice for five hours anymore. Like, I may only, I told my coach this year, I was like, I got two hours for you today. I will work really hard, but I only got two hours. I can't do everything. Like, I can't do my individual work and my practice and, you know, the weight room stuff and recovery, all that. I, I got two hours for you. You let me know what you want me to do. <laughs> you know? And, like, you gotta, you gotta, like, find your way. And it, it evolves. Yeah. It changes over time. Like, what you need on a yearly basis, a monthly basis, a daily basis, you got to have some kind of flexibility so that you can live. So I think as you get older, you try to get smarter, you try to be more efficient, um, but you kind of, over time, you're like, your body talks to you, right? If you're willing to listen to it, it tells you what you need. You know when something's not right. And so instead of just trying to like hurry up and fix this, like you got you to change the lifestyle a little bit, right? You got to change your body habits a little bit. You got to change your sleeping habits a little bit. And I think that's of the people that I watch that play for a long period of time in sport, they have good life skills, right? Like they just, they have this lifestyle that's just, it's healthy. And it's, you know, whatever you're putting into it, like it feels good for you and you're enjoying it. And so you're enjoying your process and you're enjoying your work. And that really shows in how long you play and the level you play. You work in different environments where you might be able, you want to listen to your bodies, you and Kevin, but you've also got a coach and management that's telling you, sure. I, you're on my clock. I can't afford for you to listen to your body. You're different. Yeah, very. Right? So you can organize or on your calendar put down an event and say, my body's not ready. I got to put this off. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the thing I struggle with the most as I moved into my 40s is finding the motivation to keep going out and spending like night after night in a tent in the snow. <laughs> It's not that sweet. Um, and like not having showers for weeks on end. And um, I took a shower this morning, though. But, um, <laughs> but it's finding motivation. And maybe you guys struggle with that as you, you, you've done this enough times. But so I, I like to ha add, and you mentioned this, add a little bit of humor into what I do and make it fun and realize that I love it and find the right people to train with and do things with and that gives me the motivation and that mm -hmm. keeps me going and, and keeps me passionate. So does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, I know for you, you know, you've got to do a lot of your own traveling and, and it might be booked for you, but you, you got to get there on your own. Yeah. You got to There's pack your own equipment and, and all that. Yeah. Um, for, the, for the guys in the NBA, it's a little bit different and life has changed. I remember <clears throat> not that long ago, but there was a time in the, rule, in the rules in the NBA where not everybody was flying private. In fact, very few were flying private. And so the rule in the NBA was is that even if you played a night game, you had to be on the very first commercial flight the next, next morning. Day. So even if you finished at 11.30 at night, by the time you got to your hotel room at 1 o'clock in the morning, had dinner, if there was a 6.30 flight on Continental, you had to be there in order to put off you know, any chance of not being in the next city to play the next game. Mm -hmm. It's different today, right? I mean, now you guys. But, <laughs> but, but, it's, but that's part of it, right? I mean, that's part of protecting their investment, no. which is you guys, yeah. right, and your health. Yes. Is, it, is that get, right? We get much better care, and everyone is so much more thoughtful now. I think, you know, the reality is we make a lot more money than those guys did, yeah. and so they, they got to take care of us better. <laughs> they're like, they're, they're protecting their investment, yeah. right? And so, yeah, I think, I mean, the world's gotten a lot smarter. There's a lot of new information and, 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 and new ways. And the NBA has gotten so much better in just like the last five years. Commercial flights, I mean, going to private, that was a big deal. But there's a lot of things that, yeah. that the NBA is doing now, providing better food and helping us sleep better and giving us information to make better decisions. I mean, 
Yeah, they're doing a lot, a lot more than they used to. I think Kyle hit it on the head. The only thing I'll add to that is they've also done such a great job with our scheduling as well. They've taken away, uh, I think they've cut our back-to-backs from 22 to 24 down to, I would say, around 14 ballpark, mm -hmm. as well as extended the season uh, about two, two and a half weeks. And on top of that, they've cut out games that I know none of you give a shit, a shit about, and that's the preseason. So <laughs> that's, not, that's not good basketball. But I think they've, they've been, uh, as Kyle mentioned, the product on the floor, it's such a players-driven league. Um, and, and we live you know, through our, our great teams, our great superstars, our teams that are underdogs. Like it's, it's such a great product out there, and that doesn't happen unless we're healthy, unless we have. Uh, and the people that have, and the players that have come before us put in the work to get us where we are today. But as Kyle mentioned and alluded to, there's so much more money in our game. And we've been so fortunate to be able to, to, to take care of ourselves as well as the, the evolution in the science around being able to take care of our body. So it's, it's almost like a perfect balance right now. And as I mentioned to, uh, earlier, it's, it's only trending in the right direction. So that's a big positive. For those of you who don't remember, and I'll, and I'll let Kevin tell you, um, you weighed how much when you came into the league in 2008? Ballpark, 275, 280 pounds. And you weigh what now? 237. OK. So how important was that in order for you to survive the game and to be able to now say, I've got 11 NBA seasons under my belt. Yeah, well, I think that's, you know, I was, I always, I mentioned it actually, I think two weeks ago, I was the kid who had the appetite of like an unchaperoned kid at a birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I had to change that because not only how I felt in my body, but understanding, I was, I'm so thankful that I, I kind of understood that at early age. And uh, I alluded to a presence of mind early. I had the presence of mind to know that uh, I was playing the long game. This is a game I, I wanted to play for as long as Kyle uh, has, and um, uh, which is not easy to do. But it was playing against the top level guys. Where, as in college, on a given week, you'd play at most two games. In the NBA, you were getting those four games in five nights. You, get, you were getting seven and twelve. It was uh, so games were coming at you so fast, as well as. At my position, I was playing against Hall of Flame players. So I'd play against Tim Duncan or Dirk Nowitzki. I'd be in one night uh, in so Dallas or San Antonio, fly back home to, to Minneapolis, where I played six seasons, and then playing against Kevin Garnett. And I thought to myself, this, this body ain't cutting it. <laughs> so I think that was an eye-opening experience for me. And that's just not something you learn. You have to go through, through it. You have to have trials and tribulations. You have to have failure. But I knew very quickly that you know, my body wasn't going to hold up over time unless I made a big change. And uh, I'll go back to Kyle again. It was sleep. It was eating. It was uh, making sure that, uh, you know, I was getting the proper treatments on my body. And it was changing my routine in order to get the best out of myself. And a lot of that was cutting down the weight, the weight first and then working on all the other core competencies. How regimented are each of you? in the way you eat, the way you sleep, the way you train? How much of it is a routine? I mean, even, even as average athletes, you wake up every day and say, oh, I don't want to do my four miles today, or whatever, whatever the activity is. But how much do you guys stick to a plan to the letter of the law? I think my program is probably a lot looser than yours. <laughs> um, the expedition diet is kind of eat anything and everything you can, so you can. <laughs> put weight on That's so that you secret, have huh? a secret. <laughs> nice. It's really nice, actually. Yeah. You wear it well. I, I don't, I'm not, it's, it's a, the upside of yeah. the suffering. Um, <laughs> but th there is, for me, there's a strategy, or I mean, I, th th to put weight on and um, I have to eat a lot of protein and carbohydrates, et cetera. Um, and I and don't- And you do that prior to going prior out? Prior to a big expedition because at elevation, and I'm talking you know, in the 20s, 20,000 feet and up, um, you're burning 6,000 calories a day doing nothing. So you have to be able to eat. And actually one of the hardest things when you are at altitude is you lose your appetite. And I think why I'm able to do so well is I can keep eating. So I might, if someone hasn't finished their meal, you know, I'm like, can I finish that for you, please? Um, because you really do lose your appetite. And, uh, and it's just, it's a race against time of maintaining your physical strength and 
finishing your climbing within this window before you just are emaciated, basically. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite different, I think. And when it comes to like physically training, I, I try to do a wide variety of sports so that um, I, I look at my body as, as in these different planes, and I want it to be able to work in every plane. And you don't get that from just running or just skiing. You have to ride bikes. You have to um, do all, all kinds of different things. Yeah. So. Do you lift weights at all? Um, I, I don't. I'm not much of a traditional um, gym person. I tend to do all my training outside. Um, I live in Telluride, so it's right out my back door. Ice climbing, rock climbing, et cetera. So it's a little different. I think for me, like, I, got, uh, I try to be as strict as possible, but there's this thing called life that's happening. Right. That's I got hard. a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. <laughs> It's like kind of hard sometimes, right? I think one of the biggest challenges for me is just finding energy, you know? Because like basketball takes a lot of energy, and then I gotta go home and be a dad, and we gotta we gotta wrestle on the ground, and I gotta tickle him. <laughs> we got we got we gotta play. I gotta go play catch and jump on trampoline, and do all these things which I want to do, but like that doesn't fit into my schedule all the way all the time, right? But it's more important. Right, so there's got to be grace in all this, right? Like we have this, so that's like, I go back to this lifestyle. Like I have, yeah, game day naps. I got to try to be in bed by a certain time. On the road is when I do my massage because that's not taking away time from my family. There's a whole lot of, like, we could all say a bunch of things that we do. But, like, you still got to live, right? Um, and there's this good balance in that. Like you can't, I can't just make it through, like, a basketball series on, or a season on coffee, like, coffee can get me through wrestling and tickling and all that stuff, but, like, I need real energy for this game, so I got to I gotta have certain things in place that I, you know, I've got enough in the tank to do, play this basketball game, chase around all these kids half my age now, right? But, like, I also got to be a dad, and so it's trying to find that balance, which is it's hard to do sometimes. Kevin, how much do you use modern technology to analyze, if you will, your activities? Do you use something to monitor your sleep so you know when you're most efficient and when you're in your deepest sleep? Do you meditate? Do you use hyperbaric chambers? What sorts of things do you use? All of that. I mean, I've uh, over the years acquired um, almost like a high performance center at my house so that I can spend more time at home. Uh, I think because, uh, like Kyle talked about, there's, there's only, you, know, you have this stress budget, right? And you can only throw so much stuff into the pot on, on a given day because we are asked so much uh, on any given day or any given week or any given month. So many games are coming at us so fast. We're traveling so much, so many miles. There's putting such a strain on our body that uh, you have to be really selective while also still living your life. So that took me a lot of time. And learning to use, yeah, meditation apps, um, a hyperbaric chamber at home, hot and cold tubs, making sure that uh, I have enough equipment at my house or at my disposal that if I need any work done or I need to do anything or I can uh, do it before or after practice, I'm able to do that. A ton of massage work. Um, so there's, there's a number of things that I've been able to integrate into my process that um, have really, in any given week, become non-negotiable. Like I have to absolutely get those done. While also, I don't know, I think it took me turning 30 and having some uh, pretty difficult mental health issues the past, uh, well, my entire life, but really uh, radical the last probably 18 months to really look at it and say, okay, I need to live my life. And maybe it was turning 30 as well, but um, it was finding that balance every day where I could get uh, the best out of myself, not only in my everyday life, but in my sport. You're, you're, you're in that a, a different category in that you had to balance not only your physical health, but your mental health. Sure. Um, has the team been receptive to that for both of you. Again, you guys work in a, in a, within a team unit. And so, you know, what you may say, this is what's good for me, this is what my personal trainer tells me is good for me, but the team may have a different idea. Yeah, I mean, I hit it for so long. It was one of those things where I was so, uh, there's such a stigma around mental health and anxiety and depression, uh, to be more specific. Um, uh, you know, as well as, not being reliable for a team. I think that was something that I was very nervous about. It was like, if, if, I, if I came out and I was very vulnerable and expressed my struggles that I deal with on an everyday basis, 
I said in my last panel that it's like wearing a weighted vest every single day. It's just waking up and having something that, that never quite leaves you, but you can change your relationship with it. I think, uh, but the NBA has been such a positive force, not only in, in uh, you know, supporting the mental health, health aspect of uh, not only what I deal with, but what the numbers say throughout the NBA, but also now they've put in uh, you know, strict guidelines. They've, they've now had uh, therapists for every single team, whether it be on the, uh, uh, the player side of things or uh, throughout the entire league uh, as a whole, even at the league offices. So I think they've been thankfully very, very supportive, but that was very scary to, to be vulnerable and, and express what I had dealt with on an everyday basis because I didn't know what the future was going to hold for me as far as, uh, you know, teams and players and coaches and organizations being able to uh, rely on me moving forward because really it has nothing to do with my play. The play is my safe place, and they know that I put in everything that we're talking about here into my craft, into my game. But that was a, yeah, a scary, scary uh, thing to consider until I realized that there's this vast community that – uh, really all has your back and you know whether it's your own personal self or somebody that you know at arm's distance or in your circle is is, is dealing with something so uh, the NBA has been a very very supportive uh, community in that regard as well when I've spoken to different athletes they tend to look at their world and say they feel very comfortable in what they do because they know how to do it and they're good at it and they look at something else you know, you might look at a professional skier and say, there's not a chance I'm going down a hill at 80, 90 miles an hour. Um, and they would say, there's not a chance I'm climbing to 26,000 feet without oxygen. Um, when you look at other athletes now with the perspective that you have, who impresses you most in the sport that they're playing? Mm -hmm. And you are amazed that they are, when you look at Tom Brady and say when he's 42, holy cow, how is that guy still taking hits from 300-pound linemen? Is there somebody that you look at in another sport yeah. and you're just dumbfounded that they're doing it? Honestly, right now, I would say Tiger Woods. I think, um, I think what we're talking about, like the technology that we have available to us, the, all the advances in science and everything, like we're all trying not to get that big injury. Like once you get that big injury, it's it's hard to come back sometimes. Like it's possible, but it gets hard. So we do all these things like the hyperbaric chamber and the cold tubs and the stretching and the lifting and understanding your body. Like we're just trying to like get, not get hurt, right? Like when I was younger, I was training so hard to jump higher and run faster. Now I'm training to not hurt, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I, I want to be strong. I want to be all these things, but like. I'm just trying to keep going. And you don't want that big injury. And Tiger Woods had a big injury. And like, it was just, and it all played out in front of everybody. You like, he's like, he's Tiger Woods. And then he was always oh, Tiger Woods. And now he's like, yeah, yeah he's Tiger Woods, man. <laughs> come on. Like, to come back from that, just knowing, you know, what he's got to go through mentally and physically. He's made changes to his swing, to his game, to his life. Those are significant things. And to do it all in the public eye, like, I think I have, I've, I've always been a Tiger Woods fan, right? But, like, just seeing, like, him work through all that and, and, and do that, like, I think he's probably, there's a lot of great guys, a lot of, and women, like, killing it at an old age, and that's awesome. But his story of, like, the up and the down and the back up is pretty inspiring. And plus his willingness to change yeah. and adapt is pretty, yeah, it's hard. Sure. We get really set in our ways, too, as we get older. And if you can avoid that, I think you have a way better chance of totally. success. Kevin, is there somebody? Yeah, no, I think Kyle nailed it. I'll, I'll speak about a couple other uh, people from the same sport. But um, it is such a, it's like tennis. It's such a lonely sport. It's only you and maybe the caddy, whereas in tennis, it's the same thing. It's just you, and you can't talk to the coach, or you get Doctor point, you get doctor game. Um, but that's, Tiger's story is really all inclusive because he dealt with both so much of the physical and that huge injury, as you mentioned, but so much of the mental as well, having gone through so many things, uh, you know, away, away from his field of play and came through it all on the other side. I mean, that's, a, that's an unbelievable, unbelievable story uh, and a testament to, to his character and his grit and his will to win. Um, but I would say, a couple others is um, Serena Williams, mm -hmm. as well as a guy like Rafael Nadal uh, and Roger Federer. I mean, those, as I mentioned, tennis is a very, very lonely sport. You have to be 
very, very headstrong and playing into your 30s, like we were mentioning uh, before we came on, finding that sweet spot. And with everything that we have at our disposal now, I think that sweet spot in your career as far as where your prime is or how long your prime is as well, just you know, keeps either extending a little bit longer or is moving back maybe in a little bit more into your 30s. And I think we'll hopefully see that continue to trend in that way. But yeah, I would say Nadal, I mean, he what, won what, his 12th French title yeah. a, couple, a few weeks ago yeah. um, with uh, uh, Serena Williams. I mean, she's, you know, had gone through a pregnancy. She's, her and Steffi Graf, obviously, uh, I mean, arguably the greatest players of all time have played uh, when well, she's 35 or 36, 37, 37, I 37, think, 37 yeah, years serene. old now, so arguably the greatest player of all time. And then Federer, he just continues to make it look effortless. And I think um, from a tennis perspective, it's just so tough because uh, you guys heard me say this, like uh, kill the body and the mind will die. Like these people continue to kill their bodies every single day, and yet they still have... Uh, you know, their mental side and the mental aspects so figured out where they just, they just know their process. They, they have figured out everything that we're talking about and functioning at, at such a high level on every side of the spectrum. I'm, I'm guessing if we come to your house, the tennis channel is on around the clock. <laughs> yes. No, I grew, I grew up in the American boom. It was like Chang, Courier, Sampras, Agassi. So I used to really piss my parents off because the garage was marked green most of the time. <laughs> I just didn't have to, you know, I was like a John Isner. I, could, I was all serve, nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Hillary, is there anybody that you can think of in another sport that you were amazed? Yeah, I mean, Serena Williams, I, yeah. I, especially seeing her have a kid come back from that from I mean she I think she's had a lot of she challenges kids, yeah but she she's only done one kids? you've done yeah. two yeah done two oh, yeah. jeez I mean, um, they was that hard too and, and they're, they're here, they're they're was, here. It, was that how big how big an obstacle was that or a challenge I should say for you to have the kids and then still say I'm gonna put my body back together and get back out there and keep climbing Oh, wow, that was really hard. Um, the, fortunately, my, my body came back in a, in a different way that was actually better for climbing, um, just leaner, um, stronger. But mentally, it was, I don't think I could do it again, to be honest. It was um, very difficult to leave my kids when they're quite young, two and four, to spend 10 weeks um, in the Himalayas, or um, but I, I was so determined, and I look back at it when, when my first son was 10 months old, I went to Pakistan for 10 weeks to climb an 8,000 meter peak. I just was so, um, and it, it kind of goes back to how I grew up and mental health, and I I, I struggled with that with um, individuals in my family, and so I was so I so related my mental health to fitness. That was my drug to fix it and make me okay. So I was so afraid after having kids that if I didn't get back into it right away, I would lose it and I wouldn't have that, that passion. I wouldn't have the ability to go back to it. So I would say I was a little bit aggressive um, going to Pakistan for two months when Quinn was 10 months old, but um, I think he's turned out okay. I was very worried about, you know, what, what was I doing to my children, but um, you know, flash forward 10 years, and uh, hopefully they, they see their mom as someone who's followed a passion and stuck with it and is still Your mom's badass, mom. I'll say. <laughs> hey, that's the... <laughs> you're the that's second person to say that about her today. <laughs> Maybe a lot more under their breath, yes, but you're sure. publicly on a stage. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, and for those of you who don't know, that, that Hillary's background as an athlete started as a high school basketball player, very chippy. So yeah, uh, as yeah. she described my whole herself, life high school, and, yeah. and uh, yeah. she, she thought about playing college basketball until her father said that he would be at every single game yeah. <laughs> if, if she did, and that's when she gave up basketball yeah. and pursued skiing. There's a, there's a longer story there, of course, but we'll leave um, that. Time is undefeated. As you now make your way up in age, and are still elite at what you do. What is the one thing, everybody talks about losing a step, whatever that means in your respective sports. 
what is the one thing you still wish you could do that you can't do now, if there is one, physically? I mean, I'd love to jump higher and not hurt quite so much and things like that. But you know what? Like, I love this whole thing. I'm not that afraid of it being done. Like, I feel like in all of this, like, I am literally leveraging all that I have. And when it's done, I'm going to be good. I believe the best is yet to come. This is just helping shape me. Yeah. Right? Like, um, like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to look back on regrets. I don't want, I want to turn over every stone. I want all that. But like, I, I kind of like getting older. Like she's like, I'm 46. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> someday I'm like, yeah, I'm 46. I'm not going to be playing basketball anymore. Like it's not going to happen. But like, you it's, come climb you, like that people always talk about the journey. I, yeah. I'm in, I'm in actually. People talk about the journey. Like I love the journey. I love learning about my body. I love this lifestyle that like, trying to find and redefine and like it's just I don't know it feels good to me just to add to that I think for if you're if you're open to it for everything that you lose as you get older there's yeah, something that you more. gain there's more sure. you you have different insight you have a different way of appreciating things um, so it's not worth regretting things that you can't do anymore. Um, it's, but, really, it's really fun to yeah. put yourself out there all the way. Yeah. It's a little scary. Play all your cards. But like what you learn about yourself in like this process. Curiosity, that whole yeah. Little, oh, just, man, it just sets you alive, right? And so, yeah, you turn over every stone. And man, I'm not quite as fast as I was before. And I, I hate getting beat off the dribble and like all this. I hate <laughs> just a separate foul. coverage for me. Like, <laughs> like, yo, yeah, but like, it's OK. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a really good process, and it's really fun to be a part of. Yeah, I mean, I think not to get too deep here, but I know we're um, all athletes, but I think the chase is always the best part. It's, and I think that changes over time. It evolves, but the chase, rather than the end result, is always the best part. That's what I've learned. And um, I had just done a mental health panel before this, and I had mentioned... Uh, somebody who was near and dear to me, somebody who I emulated, I mean, not emulated, but loved and admired and just was all, seemed to be all about the right things, traveled the world, uh, got to ask cool questions, uh, felt like I kind of lived vicariously through him, had a great family, all the money, and yet, um, you know, he took his life, and that was Anthony Bourdain. But if I could take one thing away from him, and you guys kind of alluded to it as well, is that, um, and you could use this in life, is that, uh, he taught me to be relentlessly curious without fear of prejudice. And so now that's um, really how I try and live my life. Um, I'm just, I'm into so many different pots, into so many different things. I think with, uh, in terms of, of sport and also mental health and all everything uh, business-wise I'm into, hobbies, I'm just so curious. Like I'm, I'm taking life as it comes and uh, that, that settling in and that fear has, has gone away. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be in a, in a game that's so inclusive. Our game is so inclusive. I mean, we have people from all over the world. We have, I mean, you look at the NBA Awards last night. There was Pascal Siakam. He's from uh, Cameroon. Uh, there's uh, Luka Doncic. He was Rookie of the Year. He's from Sylvania. The, the MVP was the Greek feat, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo. You see, I crushed that. I crushed it this morning, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, so it's such a global game so that, that being immersed in that sort of a culture, that prejudice has just gone out the window. So, um, you know, just being around people and, and sharing their stories and hearing their stories has been very, very uh, cool and has almost given me a life after basketball. I don't exactly know what I'm doing, but I'm excited for the possibilities. Um, I'd like to open it up to you folks out there, because I'm sure you've got better questions than I do. And why don't we, we'll start right here in the hat, right there. We're going to get a mic to you. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for being so uh, open and candid. You know, as a real sports fan, we rarely get to hear you talk about your personal stories like this, and it, it means a lot. And so just thank you for doing this. Um, I want to ask you about the NBA Finals this year because in some ways it was an amazing Finals and Toronto was extraordinary. They played their hearts out. But it was hard to watch the Warriors fall apart and we've been talking a lot about health and resilience. But yeah. 
those injuries to KD and to Clay Thompson were tough to see. And this is a team that's been playing a long season for four years. And I just wonder how you are all talking about that. Is, is, or do you read the injuries as a warning about kind of excessiveness in the NBA season, even despite the changes? Sure. Or is it just that there's always injuries and this is just a freakish thing that happened? Yeah, I, I don't know what the, the numbers say, but it does seem like when the playoffs come around, there are injuries to, I mean, some of the top players, but I can remember in my, so we went to four straight finals as well. And our first one was 14-15 uh, season. I got hurt. I uh, uh, had a label tear on my left shoulder here in uh, the Eastern Conference quarterfinals. And Kyrie Irving got hurt the first game, uh, game one in the NBA Finals. So we fought that battle of attrition early on. I mean, we were – but it, I, I guess it's all about how you respond from that. I know that um, at least Clay, he's a very resilient person. Uh, KD is a really resilient person, still very young, and um, you know Kyle had mentioned it before we came on too, and I talked about it a little bit that uh, being able to respond to these type of injuries now. I know Achilles is a very tough one, but he's just going to have to adjust, and he is so resilient. He's such a heady player and has such a beautiful game, uh, and has the physical tools that he's been blessed with. That I would be shocked if he doesn't come back and he's at the top of his game. The same thing with Clay. So I think it's all about how they accept it, respond to it, and it allows them uh, a sense of self-reflection as well, not only from their physical, but as their mental as well, how they're going to come back and you know, affect their team and affect the league in a big way. But I think Kyle might be able to speak to that a little uh, bit more. I think um, certain, like there's, there's reasons all these things happen. Like sometimes like you get hit. Kevin's, you know, his shoulder, like, yeah, he kind of got taken out. Like I had someone dive into my ankle. Like, I'm not going to work. on our team? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what? Like, you can't wear armor out there. Yeah. Like, sometimes you're going to get hurt. But with other things, like, there's a reason things happen. And both those guys had other injuries before they got this injury. And so I'm not probably the person to speak too specifically to this. Um, but I, I know that bodies, like, unless it gets hit, um, there's a reason for it. Like, our, like you can like hamstrings, ACLs. Like he pulled his hamstring on on the same leg, and he came back pretty quick. I'm not saying he shouldn't have, but he did. And then he got his ACL. KD has his calf on the same one, same leg, gets his Achilles. Like there is math to all this. Like there are reasons. Um, when you play this long into the season, one of the challenges for us is it's hard to keep doing all the little things because they're long seasons, and they played a lot of long seasons. I don't know their personal habits like that. I'm, I'm sure they tried really hard to take care of themselves. I'm sure there's probably things they wish or they could have done differently. I don't know, but I'm going to guess probably. Like, there's reasons injuries happen usually, and I think what's exciting about, you know, the opportunity to play later in life is, like, we're learning a lot about this, and we're learning how to, how to get around some of these injuries. Right, um, so that's really exciting, but I felt bad for them because that man, what a run the Warriors had, man! Yeah. Like just, and it, we're not saying it's done. Who knows what happens, right? Yeah. But like, they changed the game. Like that team changed how basketball is played in yep. the NBA, and that's they were amazing. And I, I'm big fans of all of them, and you hate to see it happen like that. It's like it sucks for all of us as fans, as for them as players. That's not how you want it to end. But it did. You know. Wow, it looks like that's the end of the Warriors. <laughs> uh, let's, go, let's go back in the corner right over there, right there. Yep. Hi, this question is for Hillary. I was wondering, um, you talked about your body after you um, gave birth, that your body came back to be leaner and stronger. That has not happened to me or any of my friends. I was wondering if you can talk about what did you do or give us some advice on how we can benefit from your wisdom. I, I, I made it sound like it just happened and it didn't, it didn't just happen. It was a, a lot of work. And, and for me, like I said, it was 10 months after my first son was born. So I had this goal set out in front of me to be on an 8,000 meter peak and I really had to get my body back and fit. And that's sort of how I work. I put these, these goals. It's like you know, chasing the carrot out in front of me. And that's, that's how I force my motivation and force my fitness sometimes, because um, it's not always easy. So 
I uh, basically would I'd go out a lot with my kids, um, do as much, as much as I could outside with them. I did a lot of Pilates, which sounds crazy, but it was really hard for me to, I'd had a C-section, so it was really hard to get that all connected again. Um, I started doing a lot of uh, physical therapy and body work. And then, I, I don't, like I said, I don't think I could do it again. I was just stubborn and gritty and um, worked really hard at it. But again, that's my job. You know, that's what I get paid to be an athlete. So it's easier for me to take, make that time. I think especially as a new mom, it's really hard to make and take time for yourself. Um, and I just had to, to work on that and make that happen. But it did in the end. Uh, my, my body was so significantly different from before having kids that it took me a while to figure out how to use it again. And a lot of that, I say strength, but the strength I think was more mental. Um, I've been an athlete my whole life, and obviously pregnancy is the first time in my life that I didn't have control of my physicality. And to experience that gave me a mental resiliency that I just didn't have before. Let's, let's get this young man right here. Hey, so I was inter interested in your guys' nutrition. You talked how you eat a lot before your long trips. And then uh, you two, how strict your diet is. And then if it is really strict, is it hard at this point in your career to keep it or to keep it that strict, or is it just natural at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've, I've tried everything. <laughs> like, I got, I got a wife who, like, we've gone down every single one of these new diets that's going on. And, you know, I, I tried vegan during the season one I was year. That, yeah, it was just like, <laughs> what am I doing right now? I'm so hungry. And I'm losing <laughs> weight. And it was a, it was a disaster. Like, um, I've, I've, I've done it all. I've, I've kind of landed on this place where I, I, just, I don't eat processed food. I don't overeat. I don't, like, I don't really have a desire to eat a lot of junk food. It's just, you know, it's like when you, like, I grew, growing up, I drank soda all the time, right? You drink Mountain Dew, you drink whatever. And then if you don't drink it for a while, like, it's like, why would I drink a Mountain Dew? Right. It's kind of been the same way for a lot of those foods with me. Don't eat processed, or I don't, I don't eat processed foods. Try to eat moderation, a lot of plant-based stuff, occasional meat. Um, I don't want this to be, I don't want this to have too much power in my life. Like, I eat, like, I don't, I don't eat for fun that much. I eat what I need. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a different mindset that you bring to food. Uh, there's exceptions, you gotta live. But like, yeah, just, I feel like I got a pretty healthy relationship with food right now. Yeah, I think like Kyle said too, I mean, my, my diet is pretty simple. Like if I wrote it out for you, you would think, oh, that, that doesn't seem too complex. But um, for me, it's planning, always planning ahead because there's gonna be times where life happens or uh, you know, your schedule's gonna throw you a curveball. So just knowing, like planning in advance that that could happen and then having your foods in place. So just keep feeding your body the right things so you know, you're absorbing all the nutrients you need so that your body can function at a high level. Also, for me, early on, I had to learn discipline. I had to real, you know, figure out what discipline was, and that was deciding between what I wanted now, like do I want to kill this whole plate of pizza right now, or what do I want most? What I want most is to uh, you know, be a star player in the NBA help my team and uh, you know, be recognized as a, as a top ball player. So I had to realize that that discipline played a huge, huge part in that. And that's the way I've looked at uh, a number of things in my life, but uh, nutrition uh, at the very, very top of the list. Hillary? Um, as I've gotten older and especially into my 40s, I feel like I used to be able to eat anything and everything like I made sort of a joke of. but. I am more sensitive to things now, but it's really important for me to be able to be adaptable with food because there's huge chunks of time where I don't have control over what I'm eating. I'm, I'm eating yak meat or um, goat that was you know, slaughtered on the farm in Pakistan or I'm living off of potatoes and lentils and I don't, I don't necessarily get that, that choice of what I can put in my body. So I... I'm always kind of like testing things. I have a very meat heavy diet, um, as my uh, boyfriend over there would attest to. But I've been trying to work on that and make it um, 
a little bit more plant-based and um, just a little more variable because I have to remain adaptable to how I eat. Uh, let's go right there. heard a lot about the physicality and the regimens that you do. Tell us a little bit about what you do mentally. What happens on a day when you wake up and you have a game and you just don't feel like playing, or does that happen? How do you stay healthy and fit mentally with the regimen and the schedule? I mean, it's a brutal schedule as the year progresses. There you go. It's, uh, yeah, the mind's a big part of this battle. Right, I think this has been like, like this is all mind, body, spirit. Like all, you need all three to be a healthy person, to be your best version of a basketball player, uh, climber, wh whatever it is. Like mind, body, spirit. Like they're all connected, and uh, and so and I think people are more I mean, mindfulness is a thing now, right? We talk about this. As I've heard several talks here about that here. Like there's it, it's it's getting more momentum right now. People are more aware of like how powerful our mind is and how we look at something, just our our perception of this thing. It changes my energy. Uh, so a med med meditation. Uh, I'm a I'm a Christian. So prayer. Um, being able to uh, you know get outside of my own head and outside of these worries that I have um, about the game or not feeling the moment like. Uh, for me, I usually wake up and I got these kids jumping on me and I'm gonna do whatever, right? My pregame nap is where I move into that. I have one of these uh, chambers that Kevin was talking about and I'm gonna spend two hours in there. I'm gonna sleep in there, I'm gonna meditate, I'm gonna get my mind right. And then I have the mindset of waking up, taking my shower, moving on to the game. So that's my space that I know no matter what on a game day, like I'm gonna have this chunk of time to get myself right because it's really important for sure. Kevin, meditation is a big part of your process too, right? It is. It's something that um, I've continued to try to excel at. It's not something that I think just, I mean, at least for me, hasn't just come easy for me right out of the gate. But I mean, we're so fortunate now to live in a uh, live in a time where I literally use either um, Headspace or Calm or these apps that have. Anywhere from uh, uh, one minute, six deep breaths uh, meditation for, for sleep, or a three minute uh, uh, session for anxiety, or you have these 30 minute to an hour sessions, depending on uh, you know, how much time you have, or if you're like an expert uh, meditator, but it's, it's really what you need in that moment. Like you have to, uh, you know, mind, body, and spirit, as, as, uh, as Kyle said, you have to kind of assess where you're at in that day, and obviously that comes with time, but meditation is, something you really have to uh, practice. And it doesn't have to be the same amount of time every day. Like, you don't have to be perfect in that regard. But just taking those breaths and, and, and resetting your body and getting out of your mind just for, even if it's just for a minute or two each day, I think that is, uh, you know, whether you're, you know, a, a young kid just learning to do it or you're an expert. I have, a, I have an uncle who's practiced uh, Transcendental Meditation TM for 50-plus years. And... You know, he's a guy that's played the long game. He's in, he's in rock and roll, and uh, he's almost 80 years old now and is still you know, doing 150, 160 shows a year. And he, he says a, a big part of that is his meditation, and I believe it because he's, he wears it well. He still has super high energy, and he, he does 20 minutes twice a day, morning and night, um, and just really feels great um, in that holy trinity, like you said. Let's come uh, let's, right there. No, no, right there. You need a mic? Yeah. <laughs> Hillary, Kyle, and Kevin, again, thanks for your inspiration. That was um, very special to all of us. Um, one question I have as you evolve from young athletes in your 20s to later into your 30s and 40s, has there also been an evolution in your uh, trainers and coaches that are more adept and specialized in dealing with older athletes? I can answer that uh, just because I, I, I literally just went through it. Um, you know, Kyle was with us on the Cavs and, and knew my former trainer who was uh, Australian. His name's Alex Moore. And he was, uh, at the time, when I, when I first got on the Cavs, I was, I believe, 26 years old. And, you know, I was doing a ton of Olympic lifting. And I found in doing that over time, and he's our sports performance director, a uh, very, very sharp guy, but over time, uh, my body just felt really tight. 
and I felt like I was kind of caving in on myself and, and didn't, uh, my, my muscles didn't feel lubricated, they didn't feel elastic like they should have. So, um, you know, he actually ended up moving back with his family to uh, Australia, and I just lucked into this uh, trainer as I turned 30 years old that, that works on uh, a number of different things. It's, it's um, you know, kind of, I hate using the word pliability, but that's pretty much what it is. It's a lot of stretching. It's uh, a lot of interval work. It's, um, you know, a lot of using a lot of the, uh, the things I mentioned I have in my house uh, to then better myself, not only physically, but mentally. So um, I think it changes over time. And I think uh, I was very lucky to be open to that because I think uh, sometimes I can be a little hard-headed and as an athlete I think a lot of a lot of us can and get stuck in your own ways but I had to be able to take a step back and try and figure out what was best for me as well as trust somebody else I think that the trust factor in everything that we do because our body is everything uh, it was trusting that person to think okay I have to you know go a separate way I have to divert from what I've usually done and have had success with but my body hasn't always felt great so how am I going to I'll play this long game and not burn it at both ends, uh, training how I had previously. Uh, this young man right here. Go. Yep. So with technology shortening the injury recovery time, how does that change your goals? So you can say, say I can make it back for playoffs, or I can use an ice axe on K2. How does that change how you <laughs> how does that change your goals because of technology? Hmm. That's a great question. That is a good question. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. I think I mean, go ahead, I've, go ahead. I've go ahead. had a lot of injuries, fortunately not like big ones, but a broken bone, a sprained ankle, a this, that, and I think the hard part is how to mentally stay healthy when you're in that space. And a big way that I do that is to put goals out in front of me mm -hmm. so that I have something to work towards. And, you know, I can use technology along that path. I think you guys probably have better access to more of the real technology. But um, just for me, asking for help, seeing the physical therapist, that those are all kind of big hurdles for me. Um, so taking those steps to recover by putting that goal out there is a, is a big way for me to deal with I think, too, like, <clears throat> one of the big secrets, or not secrets, but keys, is learning how to take care of the little things. Like, you when know, it's like all the little things that add up to eventually having a big thing happen to you, right? So, like, I, like when, you, when you're able to recover faster, you don't, maybe you don't deal with that tight hamstring quite as long, which can lead to something else, right? So I... I think, yeah, I mean, the, the ability to take care of some of these kind of smaller issues a little bit quicker, because you want to keep on playing. A lot of times yeah. when you keep on trying to, you know, push through a small injury, that's when these bigger ones can happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think just to add a little bit to that as well is that, I mean, you can look at injuries as, like, opportunities. It's, it's a chance to, all right, you're going to be taken away from the game for however long it is, whether it be, uh, you know, two weeks or two years, but it's your, it's your chance to reassess where the rest of your body is at. Where am I feeling something else? Okay, I know I have to address, you know, this calf injury I have, but what else am I feeling? How am I going to make it so that I'm not compensating on my calf when I come back to where that's going to add to, okay, now I have a, a you know, a, a lower back problem on the right side. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's definitely a chance to um, you know, take a step back, assess your body, and you know, kind of find where to go from there. Because I think a lot of people, uh, or a lot of athletes, sometimes don't put in the time to, to to then look at themselves and say, "Okay, this is exactly what I need, not only for this injury, but for the rest." We are going to have to end it there, but I want to thank Kevin, Kyle, Hillary, all of you. I hope you guys will come back in ten years yeah. and tell us how 50 is the new 30. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody.